before we before we get started, a quick announcement. You'll find links to all of our readings in the chat during our event tonight. Um, and don't forget, tonight is our first visitor visiting author reading and conversation with Azarine Van der Vliet Illumi and Brian Washington. It's at 6 p.m. Mountain Time and it's free to register. I'd like to thank the SCFD, National Endowment for the Arts, and Colorado Creative Industries for helping to make Lit Fest 2021 possible. And a special thanks to Book Bar, our official bookselling partner this year. Okay, let's get started with our first reader. Joining us uh, from lovely California and, you know, trying not to uh, brag too much about it is longtime Lighthouse faculty member, Kara Lopez-Lee. Kara, thank you for joining us and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Manuel. So this first piece I'll read um, is from my work in progress, which has been in progress for many years. It's a novel, historical novel called Candlelight Bridge. This is from a section called Pil Pilgrims, 1910, Chihuahua, Mexico. Candelaria never thought about it in those days, how the bottoms of her feet were darker than the rest of her. She always walked barefoot in Mataflores, so her soles were always dark red. Caliche, they called it, the hard red clay always underfoot in the Chihuahuan desert. Her big brother, Miguel, taught her that word in those last days before they fled for El Norte, the day she stole that raggedy old ball from him and he wrestled her to get it back, both of them rolling in the caliche till it painted them red from head to toe. A restless boy of sharp angles and outraged eyes, Miguel was always showing off how much more he knew than her because she was 12 and had only finished sixth grade while he was 14 and had made it to eighth. She knew he showed off like that because he feared that if they ever got to America, he'd never finish school. She envied Miguel his rage at every injustice, a feeling she was never allowed to express, especially over losing something nobody expected her to have in the first place an education. Her eight-year-old brother, Lalo, on the other hand, didn't care where they lived or whether he ever went back to school. With his wild green eyes, his talent for making people laugh like crazy without quite knowing why, his talent for happiness no matter what, Lalo never seemed troubled about the dirt underfoot or the dreams in his head. As for three-year-old Graciela, still the baby of La Familia Rivera, she would never remember the hot red of the Chihuahuan sunset or the slap of her bare feet on cold red caliche. Unlike the rest of them, Graciela would never have to work at forgetting. In America, Candelaria would become finicky, not only about washing her feet, but also her face and hands, doing her best also to stay out of the sun lest she grow any darker, like a dirty Mexican. Some Americanos would call her that anyway, wrinkle their noses at the hint of sun-kissed clay in her skin, even if their skin wasn't white either, but pink as a scar. She would scrub her face so hard, desperate to look clean, that her skin would sometimes turn pink too. Mama always said that to be ashamed of one's homeland was like being ashamed of one's mother, the place all people come from. Their last Christmas in Mata Flores, Mama was not yet 30, yet her face, body, and mind all seemed like parts of an ancient tree, a desert willow with solid brown trunk, twisting branches and bountiful pink flowers. Mama used such flowers to make a healing tea whenever any of them were sick. Papa was as fair as Mama was dark, a man slender, clever, and shy as a coyote. Her father was not one to boast, but he did once tell her he was descended from a long line of Spanish caballeros, men with horsemanship in their blood. He might have spoken of it more often if not for the horse that threw him into the hard red dirt, ending his career as a cowboy. During their old life in Mexico, it seemed to her that her parents were of one mind on everything. Before they fled, Papa seemed proud that Mama knew so much of the ancient wisdom of her peoples, the wandering Suma and the bold Apache, who became great horsemen in their own right. After they fled, he complained to Mama that to worship the earth was old-fashioned thinking. He said America was the land of the future, where people never let their bare feet touch the earth if they could help it. 
Candelaria's head agreed with her father, but her feet agreed with her mother, each slap of bare skin on pounded dirt an echo of her heartbeat. Every step into her future carried her deeper into the past, yet she never stepped into her memories of Mexico by choice. They always rolled across that long ago desert uninvited, bearing down on her life yet to come. The first memory was not real, though it felt real. In it, a giant wind descended on Mataflores and pulverized the caliche into a tidal wave of red dust that left all the other houses in the village standing except theirs. It lifted their adobe casita and threw it, flinging them out of its red painted door, all the Riveras holding hands like paper dolls. Her father, mother, two brothers, little sister, and her. The order felt all wrong. Candelaria and her baby sister tumbling out last, trying to keep everyone else from flying away. She grabbed Graciela with one hand and clung to the door's rusted knob with the other, shut her eyes and mouth tight, yet grit crept in until her eyes watered and her mouth filled with dirt. Her fingers turned hot and slippery, lost their grip, first on her family and then the door, sending her flying, spinning cartwheels through the swirling dust. She never landed. That was the scary part, turning end over end, no home behind or ahead, alone in the center of a moaning red cloud. So I have another something for you, and it's extremely different from that one, but it is it is a, a referring to the same work. So I, I went to a writing conference uh, once where I got a little piece of advice, as you do, um, and, and it actually was about my novel, and um, the advice really kind of made me laugh, and then I decided what would it be like to take this piece of advice all the way. So this is a piece of satire that I wrote that was uh, recently published in Slackjaw. Um, so um, here it is. Never kill a dog or cat in your novel. That's the title of the piece, a writer's guide. Never kill a dog or cat in your novel. You'll lose readers and you'll get hate mail. Say you've decided to write that novel and you insist it really needs the scene based on the time your psycho high school boyfriend stuck a lit firecracker up an alley cat's ass. Please include a warning. Adorable kitty meets fiery end in this book. You'll still lose readers, but you'll get less hate mail, except from your ex who may send a mail bomb. Side note to self, get P.O. box. Okay. Have fun killing off any humans you want, any way you want, beheaded by bandits, caught in crossfire, wasting away from a broken heart, so long as no dogs or cats are harmed in the process. Your villain can be a psychopath, though never a psychopathic pedophile. This will make literary agents uncomfortable. However, your hero can be a psychopathic pedophile. Agents will find your hero interesting. Never make your villain more interesting than your hero. Heroes must not be boring. This is frowned on almost as much as killing a dog or cat. Almost. Nothing is worse than any character for any reason killing a cat or dog. In real life, psychos often kill dogs and cats, but if your fictional hero is a psycho, he must be kind to dogs and cats, so readers will believe he's misunderstood. Misunderstood heroes often kill people, but never kill dogs or cats. Readers would misunderstand. If you must make a sexual predator your book's hero, make sure readers get that you get he's a tragic hero. On second thought, you can't pull this off. Only Nabokov could because he was Russian. People expect tragic excess from Russians. Russia is cold. But Lolita still gets banned a lot. If you believe book banning makes great publicity, go ahead. Make a sexual predator your hero. So long as he does not kill dogs or cats, that makes that for bad publicity. If one of your characters feels compelled to kill an animal, make it a coyote. Sure, a coyote looks cute like a dog, and readers will feel sorry for it, but then they'll remember the pack of coyotes that once ate their calico or their friend's Pomeranian and conclude that the fictional coyote's death was necessary for plot or character development. If your villain kills a coyote, then shooting, hanging, and stabbing it is overkill. Edit out the stabbing. Otherwise, readers will recommend you see a therapist. It's permissible to base this scene on a real life incident in which a dog was shot by one of your embarrassing relatives, a distant relative. Terrible things happen in real life. 
Actually, terrible things happen in bestsellers too, except killing dogs and cats. Those books go straight to the bargain bin. Notable exceptions, Old Yeller, Marley and Me, and The Art of Racing in the Rain. Thing is, those dogs were euthanized. So unless you're exceptional, don't euthanize a dog or cat in your novel. If you cannot resist euthanizing a dog or cat in your book, see a therapist, something is wrong with you. If a baby dies in your book, this is depressing, but acceptable. Now, if a dog or cat kills a baby in your book, this is also acceptable so long as nobody kills the responsible dog or cat. Readers find human death poignant. It reminds them of loss in ways that are healing. But if a dog or cat dies, even a guilty one, your audience will boycott you on behalf of their own pets who are innocent. That's not to say your cat doesn't dream of killing you. It often does, but it would never admit this in writing. Cats are smart that way. It's okay to kill a parrot in your book or a scarlet macaw, which you should never keep as a pet because they're endangered. Come to think of it, don't kill a scarlet macaw in your book. Have the cat do it. Cats are murderers. The dog would never do it. Now, if you're a dog person, you believe this is because dogs are sweet. If you're a cat person, you believe this is because dogs are stupid. If you're a macaw person, well, you're not going to write a book in which someone kills a scarlet macaw now, are you? Either way, be true to yourself. Write what is in your heart except if what's in your heart is to kill a dog or cat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. That was <laughs> so great. And as you mentioned, um, so with Kara in California, most of our interaction these days happens to be on Twitter. So it's on good Twitter. to see you. Yeah, Good to in see real you life, on or Zoom. almost real life. Not actual, <laughs> it, it's the closest thing I get to real life. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see you. So our next reader, I know she keeps asking for slot number six, but uh, we're going with slot number two. Our next reader is going to be Tawana Latrice Hill. That six is my favorite number. That purple I know. is my favorite color. Well, we'll go in slot purple then. Okay. Uh, number two just happened to correlate with slot purple. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tawana. Well, hi, my name is Tawana, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see everyone. Um, I am writing memoir, and my memoir is titled What's Done in the Dark. And this is from, this is part of the backstory to the memoir. So it's called Forever Hold Your Peace. I edged down the drive and then turned back toward the house. No sign of grandma. I crept down the street, my head bent and shoulders bowed and made my way to the intersection of 36th and Station. I stepped up onto the rim of a sewer cover, balanced on the edge. In my mind, I became a tightrope walker circling the trench a cesspool roaring beneath my feet. Tree roots had penetrated the rusted drain pipe and I wrenched at the fractured wood until a chunk snapped free. I raised one arm high above my head, a lightning rod for the energy of the sun and extended the other toward the upstart warlock I imagined who dared to challenge a wizard of my prowess to a test of skill and power. A yellow van weaved across the center line and stopped short of the intersection, angled crazily. The driver, a worn looking woman with straw colored plaques, swung blindly at two yelping dogs and an unbelted child bouncing frantically in the back seat. She lurched forward and spread through the intersection, her attention still captured by the cacophony of barks and cries that reverberated inside her vehicle and spilled out onto the street. I waved my sword at them and I growled. I, a mighty samurai, would fend off the interlopers pillaging the villages in my domain. I spun round and slashed at the horde of armies that advanced to flank me. They withered beneath my gaze. The ones I didn't shred to bits, I reveled in my power. The chugging engine of a junk truck brought me back to Station Street. A wizened man roosted tight at the helm he clenched the well wheel and peered over it, hugging the steering column like a sculler rocking over from the drive stroke. I stepped back from the curb into the grass as he drove past me, convinced he wouldn't see me, couldn't see me, 
or much of anything besides light and shadow. I twirled my baton, a drum major like my brother. I strode in ever widening circles, my knees up to my waist, a stick spinning a blur as I marched to the beat of a band that only I could hear. Another car, a four-door two-tone blue on blue sedan, stopped across from me. The driver leaned back, his hand on his forehead. The car idled for several moments. The man thrust his fist against its roof, shut it violently and let out a short cry. Then a woman's head surfaced from the depths of the front seat. He kissed her forehead. Squealing, an old green pickup careened down the block. Its grill plowed into the blue sedan's front end, trapping it against the curb. I dropped my stick. There was yelling and shouting. The people seemed to know each other. The truck driver disappeared from view. The car driver yelled, gesticulating wildly. The truck driver rematerialized. The woman in the car sat unmoving while the driver relentlessly blared his horn. Some kind of long gun was raised above the dashboard of the truck. The woman's face stretched wide with horror. She screamed. The trucker grasped the stock and leveled the shotgun at the blue sedan's open windows. The car driver's expression turned from anger to open mouthed panic as he pointlessly twisted the steering wheel, the front end grinding against the truck that had rammed it. The truck driver braced the gun against his shoulder. The other driver raised his arm, crossed him in front of his face. The woman ducked, the man didn't. Everything exploded. I heard a tremendous boom that made my bones tremble. From where I stood in the high grass, I could see, I saw everything. I remember the colors on the windshield. They smeared the glass where the man's head had been. There was red, lots of red from the blood. It was like somebody had poured red paint out of a can and threw some other colors in too, but didn't mix them up very well. There were trails of black and gray, pocked with white and whatever color glass is. The passenger shrieked in bursts of rapid piercing screams. She scrambled over the headless body, somehow got the door open and vaulted onto the sidewalk, landing on her knee with a sickening crunch. The truck driver stepped out into the street. The woman shoved her fist in her mouth. Little Muse escaped. The truck driver rounded the front of the car. The woman jumped up, took a single step, cried out and collapsed. The lower part of her left leg twisted away from her thigh. She dragged her body to the trunk, hoisted herself to her feet, and then kicked her high heel shoe from her good leg. She fled, staggering the length of the block like a newly risen zombie. The trucker moved slowly and silently. He laid his shotgun in the grass by the stop sign. Then he just sat there. I didn't. I ran. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawana. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your flexibility moving to uh, number two. Or purple. Um, our next reader is a Lighthouse faculty member. So Andre Hoylet will be joining us. Uh, I know Andre read last night at our faculty reading. And so we're really excited that he's joining us. So. Hey, thanks, Manuel. Um, I have to apologize, everyone. The, the camera on this particular laptop doesn't work. So you get to kind of stare at that static picture, um, unfortunately. Um, but I'll read a few poems for you. Uh, the first one um, I read last night, <clears throat> it's called Sermon on Ru Ruination. How do bones fly? Wings, feathered graves, thin and hollow. Cavort luminously, the way sins fluoresce in fire, a calypso on your spine. Prayer seeps, heavy breaths, his vision blacked into the mountain's mist. I thought of thy hibiscus bush, 
gone now 20 years that lived at my great grand's house. Erect mustard stamen and petals, pink lipped, tender, nodded to the wind, grew out of concrete, soared over the gully, choked with timber sized bamboo. There was a sun, but a let go of his hand before a thunderstorm. His spirit, already untied, drifted to be shredded on a thicket of branches, his black body torn, but safe from America, now ruined in the claw of a tree. Uh, this next one is called And Waking. And waking, I heard the rain parse itself through the cottonwood, slap each leaf down to thirsty lawns, tap my window, heard it pool, wet on smooth stones. And Casals came to mind, the box suites that you always put on when you lit salt lamps so we could be nude, newborn, in softer blush. I felt your hand in the middle of my chest from so many years ago when every possibility could have been ours, flipped golden fortunes on every turn tarot. And I wanted to be then when you put your hand on me, steadied when you rode me. I was useful, a rock you could lean into before you came. I would hear the rain's pace, a la monde, see the hips, sitting body of the cello in the darkened corner. I ran out to smell the rain, feel it cool on my skin and remember us, but it was dry ground, just the memory rattling dead leaves in the wind. Um, this is an elegy poem uh, for a friend of mine who uh, passed away uh, a little over a year ago now. Your burial shroud came in the mail today. An elegy for Allie Gerkman. Your burial shroud came in the mail today. Hemp or muslin reminded me of the Kaddish, Jewish or Ginsburg. You were sleeping in the other room. We listened for your stirrings every breath, holding hours between yours. What are the words for this? Remember the summer day last year after metastasis, your car running six hours parked across from my house? Rain slipped between the oak's broad barrel leaves, danced against young acorns before smacking the windshield. Neither of us could leave each other, an embrace and conversation as if we were practicing for this moment, now at the escarpment. In the car, your eyes filled with worrying, brimming over your swollen lids. I said it wasn't time yet. And you, how do you know? And me, I just do, and it's not now. You asked how long I thought, but I didn't know. Instead, I told you how I would die, and that made you feel better understanding that I knew how it would come and greeted it. Forty years ago, your restless body found comfort in the sway of your mother's arms. And last month, yesterday, and today, she rubs your legs the same, humming as she moves to your back and head, trying to allay your sight of the approaching mystery. I will not dignify the destroyer by naming it a gluttonous, awful affliction, torn from the side of terror and angst, vengeful. I hope years from now, still ready to curse, it does not find you. <clears throat> Last night, a storm pounded the solarium glass of the house in which you have chosen to do your leaving. The rain smacked and rolled all night. I slept across from you and you entered my dreaming, spoke again, though you cannot now, laughed again, though you cannot now a hymn to my ears before waking. My Lord, I cannot lie. Your dying is beautiful, as is the way you've lived. You disappear in glorious summer alley, reborn Corre in Eleusis. Face him now, 
firmly caress death's face like the warm sun through wood and glass. Take his teeth, tame him as you trace his lips and face like a lover. I will await you in spring, in the meadow, erupting with fiddleheads, blossom, all teeth, and laughter. And this is the uh, last one. Cry, verb, cried, crying. To utter lamentation, to weep, to suffer, to grieve, to wail with tears, to wail without tears, to collapse sometimes on one's knees, to hold the mouth agape, scream sometimes without sound, done unto God, a shoulder, a pillow, or the crook of an arm, to warn, to become intimate with unsuitable lovers, calloused, mean, apathetic, sadistic, selfish, manipulative, fouled with self-hatred, to lose, to win, to call as if for help, to arms, to my arms, and embrace, to feel the wave barely reach the toes, to feel the wave cold and sliding off the feet, to feel the wave rush the legs, to feel the wave gather at the thighs, cool but temperate, torrent around the groin sloshing, caress the belly, swirl the gut, crash the hollow, crash the groin, crash the chest, crash a contortion, crash an orgasm, to call out as in to God or a person's name, to collapse in ecstasy of giving birth, to remorse the stillness of tiny hands, to have lost as in a loved one, matriarch, patriarch, child, lover, teacher, friend, to be ecstatic as in the abundance of joy, to be incoherent, hysterical, drum inarticulate vowels, grief, to be illiterate in the language of one's own life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. Yeah. I just want to say this to all of our readers, your pieces have been amazing and wonderful. So thank you for sharing them with us tonight. Our next reader is Philip Clapham. And Philip, we'll go ahead and spotlight you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, thanks everyone. Um, so the piece that I'm sharing is a part of, um, a manuscript I'm working on really that sort of revolves around a character that I've been fascinated with for some time. Uh, he's a young uh, uh, black queer man in 1960s New York and he's from New Jersey but he's just sort of hopped over the Hudson to into the city and, and found himself in, a, in, a, in some trouble. Um, so that's sort of what the story is about. Uh, New York City, February 1960. The invitation started with the tap of the foot and the cardinal rule of hustling was to never bite off more than you could chew. So when Ambrose departed from the jitney that ran from Jersey City into the middle of Port Authority, red suitcases and tow, he knew he had to choose wisely. He just left his parents' home on the other side of the Hudson to set himself up in Manhattan, a room in Hell's Kitchen close to Broadway, uh, and if necessary, a boarding house in Greenwich could work too. However, however unlikely it seemed that Ambrose would or could secure a roof over his head with little to no planning, he knew he, he knew he was blessed with the gift of resilience. Something partly clever, partly serendipitous that from the outside looking in, it bordered on pre predetermination. He wanted the glamorous life that only proximity to the real New York City could bring. But he told his family was more practical that being in Manhattan put him closer to the odd jobs that filled his days and would make him more punctual, more responsible, and ultimately more independent. 
The day of departure, Artemis, his mother and model for all things glamorous, whipped an apron over her plaid house dress, swept quickly to the phonograph console to find what she always thought was the right music for the right moment and packed up his little red suitcase. Shirts, trousers, and drawers should last you at least a week before laundry, she said, wafting into the parlor with Ambrose's suitcase in hand, singing along to the song she just placed on the phonograph. Ambrose stood in the main entry, giving himself a final check, tucking the crisp cotton shirt under his knitted cardigan taut beneath his pleated trousers. Take as much as you can carry, Bonaparte, his father, grumbled from around the corner in the parlor room. Like most afternoons, he sat in his reading chair with the latest issue of some periodical. Today, it was Ebony Magazine. He doesn't mean that, Artemis reassured. I do so, he puffed. And please, don't ring my telephone, or worse yet, show up back on this doorstep looking for a handout. Artemis sucked her teeth. Your North Philly, your North Philly roots are showing, my dear wife, Bonaparte volleyed like a grenade over their invisible trench. Be a man, son. It's time to stand up on your own two feet, Bonaparte said. For once, he added, filling the beat between page turnings with a glance from over the ridge of his black brimmed glasses into the hallway where his wife and son stood. Ambrose peered around the corner and nodded to his father, a bulking but regal man who sat legs crossed and half hidden behind the large magazine. It was the February 1960 issue with headlines, what white people ask about Negroes and African leader visits the South and pictured was the president of Ghana and his light skinned but somewhat pudgy wife. Behind them, an illustrative map of the dark continent for other Negroes to know where in the hell Guinea was in the first place. Speaking of feet, remember that home is one bridge, one tunnel and several short walks away, his mother detonated her final salvo. Ambrose remembers smiling at her audacity. Nothing seemed impossible to him knowing her unshakable faith. It was the kind of faith that only artists shared for one another. Queer, colored, and from New Jersey, despite all that, he could be anything. Ambrose wasn't sure what had conjured his homesickness so soon. Was it, was it his shoes? And then he remembered he was in the middle of a story about sitting in the concourse waiting, uh, in the concourse waiting room with the task at hand. He had perched himself at the end of a bench with the men's room door with, within view. He watched as the flashy midtown business class donning suits with mashing fedoras dashed into the loo with their briefcases and overcoats in hand. He remembered their faces, their fedoras and briefcases, but most importantly, their shoes. That's what matters most in a tea room. Wingtips and monk straps usually belong to the accountants and insurance men. Blue suede and loafers were the provenance of the broke, beatnecks and coeds. Knowing what shoes belong to which gentleman means the difference between a good lay and a good pay. He times the wingtips as they walk in. He moves, scanning the stall, skipping over the loafers, wingtips. He, he occupies the stall beside them. He sits, watching the wingtips for movement, listening for evidence that his neighbor is not making water or that other stuff. It's quiet. Every now and again, Ambrose pulls paper from the roll, not to wipe, because he isn't going either. Flushing echoes from the urinals on the other side of the doors, more silence. Ambrose fills that silence with a cough and then a gentle tap of his toe. The wingtips wing answer with their own flush. Their, their owner echoes Ambrose's cough. Then another tap and another, each one more intentional, more exaggerated, but both feet inching closer to the partition as if to invite. Ambrose studies a man's silhouette reflected on the floor's tiles. He makes out the bobbing shadow between the wingtips, between the thighs. He listens for friction of fabric and the subtle sound of a spit wet, sticky wank, and he knows he's in business. Ambrose taps a final time, waving the suitor with the ball of his heel, signaling. And when the man's fingers find their way to the other side of the partition, Ambrose knows he has found that evening's accommodation. And so you're saying there's some sort of code you, you, you use to meet other homosexuals, asks Detective Lively. You'd be surprised how many men use the code and to deny such categorization, investigator. Ambrose discharged, wondering to himself how many of the strangers he'd blown were straight or queer or had wives and children at home. And is this how you met Mr. Charlie Mason, Bokeen Rambo, and the Mexican National, asked the detective. That Mexican has a name, said Ambrose. Okay, Mr. Carlos Benami, the detective asked. 
Ambrose sat silent, listening to the hum of fluorescent lights above him. The whole observation room had the feel of a principal's office, except for the sweeping views of Gotham below. He thought about Detective Lively's inquiry, uh, caring not to react or give anything away on his face. Over Detective Lively's shoulder sat another younger detective, um, an intern or perhaps uh, a new hire. If so, he'd see more um, wet behind the ears than uh, his older counterpart. Ambrose ruminated over Detective Lively's question. Sure, over the years he had met many men for many different reasons. Many had met on other trips to New York when only a high schooler. He'd met school teachers, construction workers, bankers, city councilmen, and too many rabbis to count. How strange it felt at first to enter the dirty movie palaces of Times Square in the middle of the day, enveloped by dark corners where men sat nervously watching one another. He thought about the shimmer of wedding bands and the projection lights, one on the hand of a man he'd eventually fuck in the bathroom stall, and how the man had painted all over Ambrose's dick and out of shame and nervousness forgot to wipe himself clean before pulling up his trousers. How that man quickly and unceremoniously fastened his buckle, shielded his face with his fedora and ran out onto the summer day. Did he stop to discard his shitty drawers before getting home? Did he disrobe for a shower and only then realize he'd brought home skid marked underwear? Would his wife find them in the hamper? Ambrose wanted to feel bad for these men, but in reality, they made him laugh. It was the moment he discovered that sex could be more powerful than pleasure. He began demanding things things of his sex as services rendered for cash or Yankees tickets or even trips to Europe. He threatened to report them as child molesters. He was, after all, only 17 when he began these escapades, unless they gave him what valuable things they had, wallets, watches, even those shiny wedding, wedding rings. He felt power in knowing he could bring ruin to the duplicitous and those who thought little of him. But the wives, Ambrose hoped they were getting their kicks too fooling around with their milkmen or postmen or gardeners. Hell, why not the other wife next door? He could tell the detective was pushing for the sordid details, which councilmen, which schools, which rabbis, and if the rumor was true of Negro men, and in Ambrose's case, it was, all less interesting than the escapades themselves. That a young colored boy from New Jersey could be capable of theft wasn't a stretch in the minds of most crackers but masterminding an extortion ring that stretched from New York to Los Angeles. Ambrose had always used his words to convince people they wanted to give him things, mostly cut cash and things he could hawk or use temporarily. That had only been enough to make ends meet. Until he'd met his friends and fellow accomplices, he helped, who helped him see that if it was Ambrose who was being robbed of his dignity, of his fortune, and headlining shows with, names on marquee, with his name on marquees that four sissies, two niggers, a chink and a Jew could pull off an operation with such ease was not only remarkable, it was downright revolutionary. Ambrose tittered at his own belief, disbelief. All four of you men are facing serious charges, theft, racketeering, blackmail, Detective Lively said. Questions have been swirling in papers around a string of mysterious art thefts, a lesser known painting by Edgar Degas during his time in New Orleans, taken from the home of a prominent art dealer on the Upper West Side, a fang ancestral male bust from French Equatorial Guinea, now Gabon, owned by French baker, a banker and taken from his home outside of Marseille, an Olmec ring taken from the ap ap apostolic um, nun nunciature in Mexico City, and a 10th century hanging scroll by Lee Chang, one of the from the home of an art professor in Iowa. The victims, all prominent, all men, all bachelors, all who said that the only queer thing they could put their finger on was their seemingly close ties to Ambrose and his curious collection of roommates. The younger detective in the, um, in the room took notes and manned a tape recorder while the other one asked the questions. Ambrose made it a point to only answer the old man's questions while fixating on the young man's cascading red hair, pale blue eyes, pink lips, and dimpled chin. Who's the victim here really, Ambrose retorted. What do you mean, the detective asked. Ambrose stretched up from the chair and began pacing, taking advantage of the square footage in the large interrogation room. Not the usual, not the usual type down in bowels of the building. It was above, like an observation tower at an airport. He paused at the windows, letting the sunlight warm his face as he lit a cigarette. I mean, here I am, a defenseless colored boy, he said, squelching the match light with a dramatic poof. I have no real job, nor money, nor social standing. Accused by men I considered friends, 
mentors, and yes, sometimes lovers, Ambrose said with a cackle as he circled the room, moving from corner to corner to deliver his opening arguments to the city below. He paused to take in the views of, of Queens, the Bronx, and East River Drive in the distance. It was a landscape of sharp lines and glinty geometry where nothing moved but the smoke and the cars and the people like tiny ants in an endless farm. How deceptively clean and orderly it all looked from above. Ambrose followed the morning, sli followed the morning slicing through the windows until it landed on a table where his mug shop was clipped to a file. It sat in front of the younger cop who thumbed through, who thumbed through when he wasn't tapping the microphone. Every now and again, he'd change out the tapes and announce into the microphone, bracket squad, arrest report for, Je for suspect Jesse, AKA Ambrose Dubois, homosexual. All right, Mr. Dubois, let's change subjects. Why do you call yourself Ambrose? Is it a stage name? All the world's a stage, my darling, he pointed to the young detective. And in it, you're the spinning image of Paul Newman. Maybe I can be your Maggie the Cat, Ambrose said, sashaying back into his seat crossing and uncrossing his legs before continuing his origin story. When Ambrose and the stranger exited the men's room, the game continued. For a few yards, Am for a few yards Ambrose could not make out his face, only the contours of a strong back and a thicket of brown hair sitting under the his fedora. The stranger looked back at Ambrose as he hailed a taxi, turning completely around to point Ambrose to the other door. They swept quickly into the cab, Ambrose shutting the door and sitting his small suitcase between his legs. Hotel Teresa, 125th Street and 7th Avenue, Ambrose said. Settled, he looked over his shoulder as he made his, he looked over his shoulder as he made his way from Midtown to Harlem. It was then that Ambrose became fully aware of the stranger's unsettling beauty. Their toes met on the floorboard behind the driver's seat, diverting Ambrose's nervous stare, first down, um, brown leather muck straps, and then quick check for the driver's eyes in the rearview mirror. It was raining now and the streets of New York were slick with taillights, the front and rear windows made opaque with raindrops. While the driver wasn't looking, Ambrose reached for the man's crotch and felt the throbbing erection between his legs. He dropped his smile when they pulled up to the hotel. Ambrose worked there as a concierge and through a popular spot, though a popular spot for Negro elites, it wasn't for his choice for most queens to make their tricks, to take their tricks when they had no home of their own. This is us, Ambrose announced. He fiddled in his pocket for a while until the stranger threw $5 toward the driver. The two men hopped out of the taxi and found a dry nook between the buildings. Wait here, I'll go grab a key, Ambrose said. I'll be here, the stranger smiled. Ambrose nodded, looking back as he headed through the hotel's revolving door. It was afternoon in the city, gray and bustling, and the entire intersection was teeming with steam lifting from the potholes. The stranger took in the show, light from de delicatessen marquees, concrete awnings, the ringing bells as storefront doors opened and closed, blaring car horns and barking dogs and a million conversation rose to a cacophony of light, sound and a perfect, perfect chaos to get lost in. A whisper from the service entry brought Ambrose back and before long he and the stranger were asshole naked, fucking in the bed, blinds undrawn, window open, daring to be the most despised of things, two human beings in need of shelter and companionship. Later that night, Ambrose began the real work of getting familiar with this new Mark's asset. The white stranger, whose name was Carlos, wasn't white at all, but a Spanish Syrian Jew. He grew up the son of a former soldier turned tendero who moved to Mexico City fleeing Franco's regime. He set up shop in the Roma district, selling women's clothing to a new, to a new class of affluent Mizrahi Jewry from the ancient kingdoms of Asia Minor. Carlos was a scholar, a leading expert on Mexican modernism through the lens of Trotskyist political movements and had arrived in New York City to teach, but really to rub elbows with Rocco and Pollock. Ambrose was, saw his surprise reflected in Carlos's green eyes. The sun broke through the clouds and the rain faded into the smell of fresh concrete wafting through the room. The particles in the sun, setting sun had wrapped Ambrose in a long thought, and although his body was in bed, his daydreams danced along the walls of the room into hidden corners and pinpointed all the things that had been there before, but he was now seeing anew and for the first time. He wanted his whole world showered in that ray of light, a world where a tiny hotel room could be a chalet and a cat from New Jersey could share a creaking single bed with an academic, a Mexican national. Then the dashing Mexican sprung from bed naked, except for a silver crucifix that teased a tuft of curly chest hair and brought emphasis to his muscular neck. 
Carlos's smell lingered in the sheets and Ambrose inhaled deeply, capturing all the photons in the room that had danced their way past Carlos's shoulder into the room. It made Ambrose giddy for moments before when Carlos had reached over his backside, grabbed both wrists as he orgasmed, thrusting his whole body over Ambrose while the small Christ figurine tickled his earlobe. A cigarette, may I have one? He asked in his roman romance inflected accent. Sure, Ambrose said. Where'd you learn to speak English so well? Películas Americanas, American films, of course. Carlos smiled, his thick Wyatt Earp mustache smiling with him. Ambrose watched the dark brown tendrils toss wildly over Carlos's ear and eyebrows as he leaned his, his head forward to plant a kiss on Ambrose's lips before he leapt onto his feet. Ambrose knew Carlos was tall, but noticed it even more so as he streaked across the parquet flooring. He sat on the furnace, his shoulders framed by the window. His legs were like hairy tree trunks, one bent slightly at the knee while the heft of his ass gathered between the silver grates. Ambrose took in the whole image of this foreign man and smiled a sumptuous smile. And you, little one, you don't sound like the New Yorkers. Where are you from? Carlos asked. New Jersey, but I'm looking for a place in Manhattan, he said. Carlos had arrived in New York a few weeks before being hosted at the art history department's chair, uh, being hosted at the art history department chair's brown store, brownstone just off Riverside Park in Cathedral Parkway. The chair was leaving in a few days for sabbatical in Vienna to study elements of anti-naturalism in the Spanish Renaissance paintings of El Greco. And you work here, Carlos asked. As Ambrose answered, Carlos looked towards the upper corners of the room as if he was studying the quality of the mahogany molding and other details of architectural integrity. Working here now um, makes, end meets, makes ends meet while I look for acting gigs, he replied. Well, for heaven's sakes, Carlos camped, then chuckled and nodded as he looked away from Ambrose. And do Americans watch Negrito actors, he asked. I never saw many while learning my English. Not so many in pictures, but the great white way is spotted like a Dalmatian dog with Negro talent, Ambrose said. Y mariposas, he asked. You don't see them flutter about in the pictures, Lindo. Ambrose leapt onto his feet and walked to the small vanity in the corner of the room. He squared his shoulders and puffed his chest and examined his face per careful inch, looking for cracks in the facade. He was compact but solidly built, an archetypal puck of Shakespearean dimension whose almond eyes and were lashed with mystery and a smile that denied knowledge of original sin. He was not the type of man that alarmed women with pre quarter moisture, nor would most men size up his masculinity as same class contention, but his sexiness was subtle, his allure, even as a black man, more disarming than repellent. He made you feel as if you could tell him anything and, th and there lies his true acting talent. And besides, why would you want to entertain those people? I do it for me. I want to be famous one day. I want my name on marquees from here to San Francisco. Their true entertainment is your people's endless suffering. I want a penthouse. I want a chauffeur, caviar and champagne, bananas fosters for breakfast. Your government slaughters children in Guatemala so you can eat bananas. I'm not one of those sit-in lunch counter Negroes from down South. We are all people of the South. Sounds more anarchist than art professor. Even in the art world, Carlos says, Mexicanos, Judíos y especialmente uh, los Africanos son artefactos para su captura y consumo. And social cause has never paid my rent, Ambrose said. Consumption will not save you from your indignity, Carlos said. What I love most about acting is the audience only gets what I choose to give them, Ambrose said. Matter of fact, deciding the to lower the heat on the conversation. He never asked Carlos what he had said about Mexico or Africans, so he let it go. Well, Lindo, if you're pretty, if you're between places, come stay with me, Carlos said. Keep trying if you must, he returned to the conversation. A great revolutionary once said, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Which one did he do, Ambrose asked. Carlos smiled. He was betrayed, but lived on forever. I think that's probably enough. Thank you all. Thank, thank you so much, Philip. We really appreciate that. And let, let's give it up for our other readers as well. So Kara, Tawana, Andre, Philip, th thank you all for volunteering to read. Uh, this is an amazing, amazing group. And I'm just glad that all of you shared your work with us tonight. As we finish up tonight, just a reminder, we, we have our visiting author reading with Brian Washington. 
and Azarine van der Veer Lumi. Uh, that starts in about just a little over half an hour. So join us. You can still register on our website. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. And I'm sure we'll see you at other Zoom events during LitFest. Thanks. Take care.